I recently made a video with the Mercedes-Benz CLK 63 AMG Black Series, and I told you it was one of the ultimate Mercedes-Benz models. It was, but this thing laughs in its face. This is a Mercedes-Benz CLK DTM, and it is one of the most impressive exotic sports cars of the 2000s, and one recently sold at auction for $450,000. And yet, you've probably never heard of it. Now before I get into this specific car, a little overview. The Mercedes CLK lineup is the craziest, widest lineup in the entire car industry, spanning all the way from the base level CLK 200 with a 134 horsepower four-cylinder, does it 0 to 60 in 11 seconds, all the way to the CLK GTR, which is basically a race car for the road with a mid-engine V12. In the US, we got the CLK 320 then the CLK 500 and 550. Then there was the CLK 55 AMG, then the CLK 63, and then the CLK 63 Black Series, all in increasing levels of awesomeness. This stands above them all. The CLK DTM uses a supercharged 5.4 liter V8 with 580 horsepower and 590 pound-feet of torque, 80 horsepower and 130 pound-feet above the mighty Black Series. In the CLK hierarchy, this thing is second only to the absolutely insane CLK GTR. This is basically a road-going version of the Mercedes CLK DTM touring race car. Mercedes sold only 180 of these in the entire world and only 100 coupes. Think about that, there are only 100 of these on the entire planet. Now, the CLK DTM was never sold in the United States, and most cars can't be imported until they turn 25 years old. And yet, here I am in sunny, beautiful Orange County, California, reviewing this one that I've borrowed from a viewer. That's because this CLK DTM was imported under the show or display exemption, which allows for special, very significant cars to be imported to this country, even if they aren't 25 years old, for show or for display purposes, and they're limited to just 2,500 miles a year. Year. Although I borrowed this CLK DTM from a private owner in California, it'll soon be on sale at Curated, a high-end supercar dealer in Florida, if you're interested in owning one of the only U.S. legal CLK DTMs in the entire world. Anyway, today I'm going to show you around the CLK DTM, and I'm going to show you all of its cool features and its unusual quirks. There are many. And then I'm going to get it out on the road and find out how this thing actually drives. And then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the CLK DTM experience, click the link below to go to autotrader.com slash oversteer. Now I'll start the quirks and features with a look under the hood. Take a long look. This thing makes 580 horsepower and 590 pound-feet of torque. This car came out in 2004, 2005. Those were huge numbers 13 years ago, and they're still knockout figures today. Now, there are a couple things I find interesting under the hood. One is, of course, the usual AMG plaque with the guy's signature who made this engine. I bet he felt really special the day they pulled him out of the regular production line making C32 AMG engines and put them to work making this thing. I also happen to love the warning labels. Obviously, there's a little label that says don't work on the engine if the fan is running because your hand will be damaged. But I also like the fact that the same label says don't work on the engine while you're wearing a tie because your tie could get caught in the fan as if you're ever going to work on your CLK DTM wearing a tie. I also like the other warning label that tells you to turn off the lights before working on them. It's not that unusual of a label, but look at the guy's fingers. <laughs> Why did they have to give him fingers at all? <laughs> It's so weird. Next up, moving on to the exterior, we got to talk about the wheels. Now, I always felt the wheels were a low point of this car. I always thought they really dated the car, made it look mid-2000s, and that they were way too blingy, but they are the wheels. These are the factory original Mercedes-Benz wheels, and they were unique to the DTM. They were only put on these 180 cars, and you will not see them on any other Mercedes-Benz. Another thing you won't find on other Mercedes-Benz models, or at least most of them anyway, is a wing like this. Now, this isn't one of those fancy retractable wings that goes up and down depending on how fast you're going. Instead, it's fixed in place, it's massive, it's actually wider than the trunk itself, and it's made of carbon fiber. It's not exactly the most attractive wing, but it does help this car have the look of the touring car racer that it's supposed to be emulating. 
Next up, probably this car's coolest exterior quirk, that would be the flared fenders. They're really flared in front, but in back, it's just insane. The whole body is just going down like normal, and then it looks like a dually pickup back there. The fenders in this car are giant, and they too are designed to emulate the race car. Plus, they allow Mercedes to get wider tires in this car for better grip. The most interesting thing about the fenders, though, is this. You see these ducts in the front and the back of the fenders? They're fake. I've always wondered about this my entire life, but this car is front engine, so it doesn't make sense that the rear duct would really have any massive purpose aside from maybe some cooling, but it doesn't even do that. There are no holes. Those ducts do nothing except provide a cool look. But the other thing that's interesting about the CLK DTM is that aside from the flared fenders and the wheels and that giant wing, just how much stuff is shared with the regular CLK that you could have bought for $39,000 back when this thing was selling for $300,000 plus for Mercedes-Benz. The headlights are shared, the taillights are shared, the windshield wipers are shared, and then there's my favorite, even the roof is shared, including the little anchors for roof racks. In case you want to maybe throw some bike racks on your CLK DTM or take it to the ski resort. Also shared, the side mirrors are just the regular old Mercedes CLK 320 mirrors with the little turn signals in them. And the key is absolutely identical to the one you would have gotten if you had just bought a regular Mercedes CLK, or C-Class for that matter. But then we move on to the interior, and oh boy, do you start to see the differences quickly. I thought the Black Series had a lot of differences from the regular CLK. That was nothing compared to this beast. We start with the door panel. Now the entire door panel is carbon fiber, as you can see, and there's really nothing there. It's incredibly sparse. There's a couple of speakers, and then there's just a lot of carbon fiber and a window switch. There's no leather where you can put your arm. There's no nice stitching. It's just a door panel. Interestingly, in spite of this, the door is still <laughs> surprisingly heavy. I guess it's a little lighter than the one in the regular CLK, but it's not like it's incredibly light, like in a Lotus or something. Next, we move on to another way you can easily tell this car is different from a regular CLK. The second you get inside, you notice a little sticker placed on the edge of the dashboard reminding you that this car has ultra high performance tires and you should limit yourself to 62 miles an hour if it's raining. Not if it's icy or snowy, but just if it's wet. In other words, they're saying this car may kill you. Do you get it? Next up, it's time to get inside the CLK DTM, and that's when you realize another thing that is very different from the standard CLK. That would be the seats. Now, folks, I've gotten into a lot of cars with a lot of tight sports seats, but this one has to take the cake. These are the tightest I've ever seen. The door opens normally, so getting in them isn't that tricky, but boy, are they tight when you're inside. Oh. Getting in is still a little harder than a regular CLK. And once you're sitting here, you better have gotten your wallet out and your keys because if you haven't, these things are so tight, you don't have access to your pockets. So if you wanna get those things out and you've already sat down, you're gonna be getting back out of the car. Which, by the way, is not tremendously easy oh, compared to a regular CLK. Of course, the truth is, if you got in the way I just showed you, you'd be screwed anyway. You'd have to get back out because you wouldn't be able to get to the seatbelt if you got in like that. And that's because this car doesn't have a regular seatbelt like a regular CLK. This car has a racing harness, five-point racing harness. Now, that's one of several reasons they couldn't sell this car in the United States. The U.S. doesn't allow passenger cars for the public to be sold with a racing harness. They consider those to be racing cars. But if you want to put on the harness, it's pretty simple. This one goes in here. And then I am buckled in and I'm ready to race down the roads of Orange County. I always found it funny that the government doesn't allow cars to be sold with a racing harness because racing harnesses are generally safer than regular seat belts and they're really easy to release if you get in an accident. All you gotta do, push the button and then all of the little belts come out and you can just get out of your car. Now, I swear I'm about to move away from these seats, but before I do, one more crazy thing. They don't adjust. Now, I've been in a lot of cars with a lot of tight sports seats, and usually you can raise them up or down, or sometimes there's a lumbar, or sometimes they're heated. In this car, you don't get any of that. You can move them forward or backwards, but other than that, I hope you like where you're sitting, because that's all you get. Next, we move on to the steering wheel, which has an interesting quirk in basically every possible way that it can, starting with its shape, 
It isn't a wheel. It is somewhat rounded, I guess, but mostly it's kind of square and oblong. It doesn't really look like a circular wheel at all. Then there's the material it's made out of. It's this fuzzy Alcantara, which you can see is starting to wear, but I love this material. If you're on a racetrack and you're getting sweaty, it's a hot day and you're working really hard in the car, you will always be able to grip the steering wheel. All race car steering wheels should be made of Alcantara. Then we get on to the buttons. Now the buttons might just be the quirkiest thing about the entire interior of this car. The buttons are placed on the steering wheel like they would be in a race car steering wheel. You push it and then the true chief tells you what position you're in. You push it to get your lap time or your tire temperature. But in this car, well, it doesn't quite do that. The buttons on the top, you push them like a race car and they cycle through your gauge cluster displays. So you get your fuel economy, you see what song is playing. It's maybe not the race car experience you were thinking you would get when you put on a five point harness and you push those race car looking buttons on your steering wheel. But the buttons on the bottom of the wheel, those are even funnier. That's the volume control. So you press this thing and it looks like a race car steering wheel button and instead it turns up the radio on the right or it turns down the radio on the left. No volume wheel, it has to look race car like. The other thing that's cool in this car is the shift paddles. These paddles are maybe the most serious I've ever pulled. They have this incredible weight to them so when you pull one of the shift paddles it really feels like you're doing something that matters. The weird thing about the paddles though to me is the fact that the up paddle and the down paddle, they say up and down on them but in lower case. I don't know why Mercedes decided to de-emphasize the shifting, but, well, they did. Okay, so now that we know what all the buttons on the steering wheel do, you ready for another one of the CLK DTM's most bizarre quirks? Well, that would be cruise control. This car has cruise control, but all the buttons on the steering wheel are already occupied, so where did they stick the buttons to turn on cruise control? Why, that would be in the least logical place possible. It is inside the center console at the very back between the two seats, basically next to where your butt is. And it isn't a standard button. Instead, it's this little plus sign and you sort of move it into place. If you're the kind of person who really relies on cruise control, there would be nothing more annoying than have to reach down there and figure out how to use it every time you want to turn it on. Needless to say, this car probably shouldn't have had cruise control at all. I really wonder why they bothered to include it. And since I'm in the center console, might as well show you the rest of it. There are two storage bins of random length. The cruise control is about two thirds of the way down. I don't know why they didn't put it at the top of the center console where it'd be easier to reach, but they didn't. Now above all of those bins in the cruise control, you'll get the transmission selector, which is quite cool. In this car, it's very little and you move it between gears. Despite its size, it actually has a lot of weight to it and it takes some strength to move it between gears. Now, two interesting things about the transmission selector area. One is that it writes out the words reverse and neutral, but it abbreviates park and drive as P and D. I don't know why reverse and neutral were deemed to be more special than park and drive, so they could be written out, but that's what Mercedes-Benz decided. Now, the other cool thing in the gear selector area is that it says CLK DTM, and right below that it says one out of 100. So you'll never forget that you're driving maybe the rarest car on the road. Now, directly above the gear lever in most CLKs, you have an ashtray and a little storage area, but not in this one. All that stuff is gone to save weight. In its place, you have a couple of toggle switches. The two on the left turn off traction and stability control, and the one on the right switches between manual and automatic shifting mode. These things are actually kind of cool. They feel really good, a lot better than some chintzy little plastic button, and they kind of make you feel like you're driving a race car because race cars are full of switches like this. Now, to the left of the little toggle switches, you have the start-stop button, which you can use to turn the car car on or off, although it's worth noting that there's also a regular ignition key area that you put the key in and twist it and that will also turn the car on or off. Ah, uh, redundant ignition switches within 10 inches of one another. The hallmark of weight savings. Now, a couple of the other interesting interior quirks in this car are clearly in the pursuit of weight savings. For example, look all around this interior and you won't find a lighter socket so you can plug in, for example, a phone charger. You want to charge your phone? Too bad. Here's an even crazier one. Inside this car, there's no lock button. I've looked everywhere. Even though this car has keyless entry and power locks, it seems the only way to actually lock the doors is to push on the lock itself in order to lock it, which means if you want to lock the passenger door, you have to reach across the car, push the lock down, and lock that one. And that also means that when you're driving the car, there's no way to lock the trunk. There's no lock button anywhere in this interior. I guess that's one of the things that didn't make the cut when they were trying to save weight. Another thing that didn't make the cut, now in the CLK Black Series above the stereo, there is a, an entire switch panel of blank switches. In this car, they said, forget the stupid blank switches, and they just put a carbon fiber panel there with only one button, the hazard lights. Everything else 
is gone. Another interesting weight savings quirk I noticed in this car, this car has floor mats like virtually every other car and the floor mats themselves have little clips on them so that you can push the floor mat down into the floor itself and then they'll clip on and the floor mat won't go anywhere. Well, this car, they were so obsessed with losing weight that they ditched the floor mat clips. Instead, there's some Velcro down there and that's supposed to keep the floor mat from rolling around. That is when you know you're serious about weight saving. Now, despite all those things that this car doesn't have, it's worth noting that here in the center, this car does have a cup holder and an old school iPod connector, although the owner and I believe those are aftermarket additions by someone who wanted a slightly more user-friendly CLK DTM. I'd look it up in the owner's manual, but unfortunately, the owner's manual is completely in German, as this car was never really intended to come to North America and be driven by Americans who wanted it in English. The owner's manual can be found inside the glove box, which is just a standard Mercedes CLK glove box. And in fact, that's another quirk of the interior. There are quite a few things inside this car that are shared with the standard CLK, including that glove box and also the really strange little storage compartment next to the glove box that opens in sort of an arc format and can't really be seen from the driver's seat. There are a few other things that are carried over from the standard CLK too, like for example, the climate controls and the switches for the power mirrors and for the headlights, which are over on the left of the steering wheel. Also, the air vents are straight out of a regular CLK and so is the little cluster that contains all the dome lights right above the driver's head. Not just a normal thing borrowed from the regular CLK? Well, that would be the entire back seat situation. First off, the back seats are gone, which is good because with these sports seats, I don't know how you'd get to them anyway. Instead, they've been completely replaced by acres of carbon fiber. Even the rear parcel shelf is gone and in its place is this carbon fiber parcel shelf. The other thing back there is this giant bar that goes across the car to provide for additional structural stability and also as an anchor point for the racing harness. You won't find that in a regular CLK. Another thing not like any other CLK in virtually all the other CLKs except the GTR, the windows on the side are pillarless. In other words, you can roll down the front and the back windows and you have no pillar between basically the mirror and the rear of the car. It provides this nice open air feel, but they took that out in this car. The rear windows in this particular CLK are fixed in place and you can't roll them down, only the front ones. Now, the other interesting thing in the back, that would be the fire extinguisher, or as I call it, the world's most pointless fire extinguisher because it is absolutely inaccessible, hidden behind the passenger sport seat and absolutely impossible to reach in the case of a fire when you would need to get to it quickly. Another interesting thing about the back of this car, I mentioned there's 180 of these, but only 100 coupes. That's because there's 80 converters and the convertible does have back seats and it does have a window in back that rolls down. They're not fixed like they are in the coupe. I think having a convertible version of this kind of defeats the purpose of this purpose-built track car to emulate the DTM touring car, but they're out there. Another interesting interior quirk, that would be the gauge cluster, especially the display for the speedometer and the tachometer. Now, if you look at this, you'll notice there's only one big circle in the middle for both the speedometer and the tachometer, and the way it's displayed is kind of cool. The speedometer is the outer ring, and it has a little floating red needle that goes between all of the speeds. The inner ring is the tachometer, but there's no needle. Instead, the way they display it is the little pixels inside the multifunction display light up as you increase your revs or your engine speed. Back to the outside and onto the trunk. Now, aside from this giant rear spoiler, you'll find that the trunk is fairly normal. You open it up and it looks just like a regular CLK trunk inside with regular carpeting and it's about the size of a regular CLK trunk. But it does have one difference from the regular CLK trunk and that is over on the right side there's some fluid in the trunk. We looked and it turns out that's the washer fluid. They put it back here presumably to balance the weight of the car. So depending on how full your washer fluid is, your car will either be perfectly weight balanced or a little heavy in the front or in the back. Next up, moving on to the fuel door. Now the fuel door is different from the one in the regular CLK, and that's in part because of the giant rear fender back here. It changes the shape of it, but it isn't just different in shape. It's also different in material. Open the fuel door up and you'll find that it is carbon fiber. In fact, a lot of the body panels in this car are carbon fiber, and if you look really closely, you can see the weave in some of them. That is very, very different from your standard CLK you see driving around on the street. So those are all the interesting quirks of the CLK DTM, but I wanna cover maybe the most interesting quirk, and that is our show or display law. Now, I mentioned before that a car has to be 25 years old in order for it to be imported to the United States. That's the rule. But the government makes exceptions for cars that are especially significant, like this one. They can be brought in for show or for display, and they're limited to 2,500 miles a year. But 
the car has to be especially significant. Now, I don't want you to email me and ask if your S15 Silvia is really significant enough that you can bring it in from Canada because the answer is no. The government denies virtually every car that applies for show and display, but it accepts really rare ones like this one with only 100 made for the entire world. But the process isn't easy. This here is the show or display binder for this car and has every piece of paperwork you could possibly imagine. Sale documents. It has show or display rules from previous similar cars that were brought in. It has virtually every piece of history for this car going back to when it was new. It has documentation of how rare it is, how uncommon it is, and why it deserves to be considered significant enough to be imported for show or display. It is very, very difficult. There's only a few companies that do it. One is out here in California. This one was brought in by JK Technologies in Baltimore. And the process is not a quick one. You won't be able to get it done in your regular car, but something like this you are able to bring in under show or display. Interestingly, the government has a list of cars that are already approved under show or display. I'll link to that list below. There are some really cool names on there, but you'll notice that right-hand drive Miata is not one of them. So don't even ask. So those are all the crazy quirks and the cool features of the CLK DTM, which might be the single rarest car I've ever reviewed. As this car does zero to 60 in 3.8 seconds and can hit a top speed of 200 miles an hour, it's also one of the fastest and most thrilling. And so now I must drive this incredibly rare, ultra fast exotic sports car, you know, for testing purposes. So you can you can hear the carbon fiber kind of creaking because this car doesn't have there's no like carpet and sound insulation crap in this car it's just a lot of carbon fiber and it kind of rubs together sometimes when you're you know at an angle with the car there's so much engine noise that you can hear right away uh, ride quality i mean it's just it's just bumping over everything and this car is clearly designed for sports track use the transmission is one of these old sequential manuals and it's slow like you'd expect Wow. Yeah, the transmission is, is jerky and it's kind of slow because ultimately it's, it's, you know, it's old school. I mean, this is 0405 when this came out. That's what they did back then. But this car is fast. Wow. I don't even want to know what turning off the traction control would be like. I already feel like there's way too much power. Oh, and the sound. Listen to that. Between the sound and the acceleration, it's just incredible. The steering is very heavy, which I love. You can really kind of position the car. There's none of this over-assisted crap like you'd get in a Lexus or something like that. This is how a car should steer. <laughs> so when you hit red line, the tag turns red. It's hilarious. The seat doesn't feel as uncomfortable as I expected. It's tight around my hips and my waist, but it's really tight around my shoulders. One really interesting thing, when the doors are closed, I didn't realize this before, when the doors are closed, the door panels so don't match the dashboard. The dashboard and stuff is straight out of the CLK, and the door panels are these carbon fiber things that look like they're from a race car. And it's really funny because the CLK dashboard has these circular air vents that actually stick out too far, and they're supposed to like mesh with the door and have this flowing line, and they absolutely don't. It's hilarious. That's another thing about this car. Nobody has any clue what it is. Um, the owner's telling me that some people think it's a body kit, which I could totally see, especially with these wheels. Um, and some people think, oh, it's a fast CLK, whatever. I mean, I think you're gonna get one out of a million are gonna know, holy crap, that's a CLK DTM. I need to turn around and talk to this person and find out what their story is. That would be me. If I saw this thing on the road, I would absolutely flip out. I would just embarrassingly lose it, like, like an Enzo or an F50 or something like that. It just it sounds like you're in a formation and there's other cars on the side of you. They're also accelerating. The sound is, it's not the best sound I've heard. That's the, the in tone or quality. That sort of goes to like LFA, Crew GT, that sort of thing. But it, it might be one of the most dramatic. It's just so loud. What, what is happening behind me when I floor it? And of course this thing's massively quick. <laughs> Can't believe that's, I'm feeling that in a CLK. The turn, the, the, the wheel doesn't take that many turns to lock. It might be like one or less. Um, it feels like a race car in that respect. 
there's very little body roll. That's because there's no suspension travel. That's why the ride is so harsh. Very sharp, not quite as precise as a modern exotic, but way more precise than anything I've driven from 2004. It's up there with stuff like Courier GT. It really kind of feels like that. The car, the center of gravity isn't that low, but the car really feels like that responsive. You just don't get any body roll. They've, they've eliminated all that because by making 48 stages of this car, they were able to make one that only a very small sliver of people wanted anything to do with, and that's this one. If you make just a regular AMG, whew, wow, can really handle it. If you make a regular AMG, you gotta make it also for like old guys who just want something cool. This thing is so many steps above that, you don't have to worry about those people. And so that's the Mercedes-Benz CLK DTM, one of just 180 built for the entire world and one of just 100 coupes. It's practically a race car for the road with the performance and the features to back it up. Nobody really knows about the CLK DTM. Nobody knows how special this car is, but now you know. And the next time you see a CLK K320 driving down the street with some scuffs on the bumpers and a brake light that's out and some mismatched tires, you can look at it and think about what could be. Anyway, time to give this car a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the CLK 63 Black Series earned a 9 here, but the DTM's look isn't quite as nice. It's hurt by its odd wheels, its out-of-character fixed wing, and the fact that the wheel arches might be just a little too aggressive, it gets a 7 out of 10. Next up is acceleration. The CLK DTM does 0-60 to 60 in 3.8 seconds, giving it an 8 out of 10, which is very impressive for a car from this era. Handling is tremendously sharp with heavy, precise steering. It really does feel like a race car, and it's only demerit in this category come from a relatively high center of gravity, it gets an 8 out of 10. Cool factor is debatable. Not many people know what this car is, but those of us who know would be just as excited to see one of these as an Enzo or a LaFerrari, and it gets a 9 out of 10. Importance, however, is a little lower. It's a significant special car, but because no one knows about it, it's hard to say it's crucial to Mercedes-Benz history, and it earns a 7 out of 10. Add it up, and the total weekend score is 39 out of 50, placing it in the upper echelon with some far more modern cars. As for the daily categories, starting with features, the DTM doesn't have much in the way of modern conveniences, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Comfort is poor, the seats are tight, the ride quality is very harsh, and it earns a 3 out of 10. Quality, however, is high. Everything seems like it was made well, hand-built by a bunch of German factory workers who knew they were making something special, but it doesn't quite have the nicest materials on the inside. It gets a 7 out of 10. As for practicality, it has 10.4 cubic feet of cargo space, giving it a 3 out of 10. And then there's value. These things cost $400,000, which is a huge sum of money money, and I suspect most people wouldn't think it's worth it for a car that looks like a regular CLK with a body kit. Yes, it's holding its value, and yes, those of us who get it understand why it's worth so much, but it's a hard sell to most people, and it gets a 5 out of 10. That brings the total daily score to 21 out of 50, which is no surprise for a car that seems like it's part race car. Add it up, and the total Doug score is 60 out of 100. It's not very high, but this is a little older, and it's a very special car with a narrow appeal to people who want something really, really unique.